only awesome Bob. <laughs> we got to start pro, over. pro and Bob got da, 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 mixed da, 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 up there. All right, we're going to start out. Yeah, Bob and Pro. All right, that's okay because I can edit it. It's yeah, that's good, fine. So. Take out my stupidity. That's all good. All right. I'm gonna do this. Do so the, I, so how I, about we well, do this? this is this is the way I know how to. Do. I'm edit. gonna do the intro. You do the the explanation. <laughs> okay, we can do. Turn that. it up a little. All bit. right, we're gonna change it up. All right, whenever ready? you're ready. I'm going. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Road FS Detail Memoirs. I'm Rod Pusey and I'm Jody Cedric. And every week we get together to explore the joys, the challenges, the triumphs of detailing. Yep, we're bringing the leaders, the movers, the shakers, the vendors, the business owners. And this week, we have a phenomenal guest, Mr. Bob Myers from Pro Products. Good morning to you. Good morning, guys. So, well, welcome to the show. We've uh, had you slated to get on for quite a while, and we're super excited that you could fit us into your busy schedule because we know you're like... You and I were talking earlier, you're like doing sales and product development and R&D and customer management. So before we get into all that, why don't you tell us how you got started in the business? Well, I got started in this business uh, years ago, just washing cars for, you know, a buddy of mine uh, in uh, high school. Uh, his dad, you know, owned a dealership and then, uh, uh, you know, working on weekends, then, you uh, graduated to, you know, just washing my own vehicle and end up buying a black car. Uh, of course, the rest mm. of the <laughs> is actually, you know, it's all downhill. Um, yeah. You know, paid to, paid to have somebody detail at one time and uh, looked at the whole process and went, oh, I can do that. And uh, so from there, you know, it just went from, you know, taking care of my own car, my parents' cars, and then my neighbors and neighbors' friends and uh, my banker that I used for many years said, you know, detailing is an upcoming business. And I'm like, I didn't know even know what that was. You know, people actually pay people to, you know, detail cars. I, you know, I was uh, just naive at that point. And uh, uh, I was actually in a very good, stable construction job right out of high school and uh, decided to take that leap of faith and go into, you know, cleaning up and detailing cars. Uh, uh, for a lot of friends and, you know, the rest is history. Really. I just kind of moved on to, you know, like we were talking, you know, earlier, Jody is, you know, I started up in a, in my grandparents' garage, a lot of people <clears throat> start up in their garage and, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. We have to start somewhere. Right. My, my statement is always the coolest cars come out of a 900 square foot or less garage. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you do have about that. And size I have a 900 garage. square foot garage. That's why I said it. If my garage was 950, my statement would be coolest cars come out of a 950 square foot garage. And and he is a true car guy. If you haven't noticed the shirt, he had to remind himself that he's a car guy. That's right. He? I have to remind <laughs> myself quite often. Yeah. So, so, so going from your grandma's or your grandparents' garage, you know, moving and growing your business, how did that evolve? Because, I mean, now, you know, somebody that wants to start their business, they have the advantage of social media, they have the advantage of Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff that allows them to highlight their work. It was a different game for you growing your business. Oh, heck yeah. You know, it was word of mouth in the beginning. And uh, there was times, there was nights and, you know, I was stressing that I was going to be able to, uh, uh, you know, pay the, you know, the car payment that, you know, that I had and, and make the same amount of money that I was making in construction. And, uh, you know, I had to realize that grandparents garage just wasn't going to be big enough because I was getting busier. And I started going out and knocking on more doors, dealerships and, and different, you know, car lots and realized I need a bigger place. And that's when I got hooked up with a, uh, a body shop, a collision center uh, mm -hmm. locally in Oregon. And he offered uh, a little bit bigger shop than what I had, you know, with my grandparents. Uh, but the biggest thing was the, uh, uh, the location and uh, being able to get direct business from him directly, which was literally, he still, he ended up having to cut me a check uh, over the top of the, the trade out in, in rent, you know, the lease for the, uh, the utilities and the, in the space. And, uh, 
I got so busy that I remember as if it was, you know, just last week that I was down at that shop at three o'clock in the morning and I had four or five cars that I still needed to get done by the next day. Mm. And coming, you know, walking back, you know, from the Circle K at three o'clock in the morning and just going, what am I doing? You know, I'm killing myself. And uh, that's when I decided to go ahead and, you know, hire a couple of employees to help, you know, do the work. And it was a couple of years after that that I realized that I needed an actual two or three bay uh, shop and was you know fortunate enough to get another great locations in Oregon. And uh, it was an old Texaco gas station and it was perfect. And that's where, you know, I really kind of blossomed. And uh, that was my last shop, you know, that I had was that, you know, Texaco gas station and where I was able to actually sell my business at that point. Um, nice. Because I, you know, it wasn't that I got bored of, of detailing, but I wanted, I wanted, I knew that there was something else. Uh, and I think it was the, uh, uh, the training or the teaching that um, I just naturally, I don't mind helping people out because I didn't really have that, um, you know, I, you know, it was word of mouth or I would watch, you know, I guess, other, you know, painters and, and uh, you know, people, you know, cleaning cars and how to put my touch on it. So uh, uh, it's uh, it's interesting how it seemed to grow very, very quickly. Uh, but, you know, teaching people really was, you know, I think a, a passion besides, you know, cars and cleaning cars. You know, the teaching part of it and training is uh, more where I'm, I get more satisfaction, uh, you know, from doing that. That That's, uh, you know, I. I don't think a lot of people realize how the, the difference between building a business 20 years ago versus now, you know, it's like, I've even sat down with my son. He's had a lot of little business ideas and he and I will sit at the kitchen table and we'll have, we'll whip out a, a website for him in about 30 minutes. And, and he's, you know, he goes and does a Shopify thing and next, you know, in an evening he's up and running, you know, selling product. And so it definitely is a different game. So as you <clears throat> built your business and you decided to make that transition out of owning your detailing shop into working for pro products, how, how was that transition made and what have you become in the process over those years well before i you know before i came on with pro uh i went in uh as a consultant uh for a uh, a dealership over on the coast and then a body shop chain uh in portland and mm -hmm. i was hired for 12 months to basically take their reconditioning detail department and make it generate money you know as a positive instead of it being a money pit Mm -hmm. And uh, I was good at that. I was able to, uh, you know, train the right people, you know, unfortunately fire and, and hire the right people. And, uh, you know, that was kind of my forte for about two to three years. And uh, there was a little bit of a dry spell. And one of my suppliers was a pro, you know, pro product distributor. And I kind of brought him along wherever I went. It was one of those things that once you found a brand and it wasn't, just the brand. It was obviously the distributor, the salesperson that helped me mm. in my business and what I wanted to do. And uh, so I brought him, you know, every place I went and everything was, you know, uh, golden. And he ended up actually uh, breaking away from being a, a salesman uh, and a sales rep for BAF, you know, pro products down in California and said, hey, if you're ever down in SoCal, Give me a holler. Well, I decided to figure out, well, what was the big thing about California and uh, had a two week vacation planned and made a phone call. We hooked up for lunch and it ended up being a, a job interview. And uh, uh, I'll never forget, you know, I was I was in flip flop shorts and, a <laughs> and I had, you know, the the owners of the uh, the company sitting down at lunch with me and they were all in suits. <laughs> and figured out real quick this wasn't just a uh, you know a California lunch so uh, it was quite interesting and you know interviewed me and said you know you aren't really what we're looking for right now you need a little bit more sales experience and I'm like well that's fine I didn't know I was on an interview 
And, yeah, you, and you need to get out of your flip flops. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. You're all good. <laughs> no, that's awesome. So, so uh, after that, I, uh, I think it was about 30 days. I got a call from a, uh, a pro distributor in San Diego that was looking for a sales rep. And he talked to me. It was probably the longest phone conversation in my life. I think it was about five hours. Oh, uh, was the, the interview. And I was living, you know, I moved back home uh, with my parents and they were wondering, you know, who are you talking to, you know, for five hours? And I uh, said, so I think I just accepted a job in San Diego. <laughs> And he moved me down there. He, you know, paid my expenses to move down cold Turkey. I took the leap of faith and worked for, uh, uh, you know, the pro distributor down there in San Diego for five, six years and, uh, had the opportunity of a sales rep from pro products came out and worked with me, you know, for uh, a couple of days was really impressed with, uh, with me and, and, uh, how I was not just selling product, but I was also, selling the knowledge and how to, you know, help them use the product and how to uh, try to not so much cut corners, but how to do things a little bit smarter than harder. And uh, uh, was really impressed with me and said, hey, you know, whenever you want to, uh, you know, a job, you know, with the company, let me know. And I'm like, ah, I'm OK. I'm, I'm really satisfied, you know, working my eight, nine hours a day and, you know, going to the beach and doing, you know, what everybody does in SoCal. And uh, uh, I uh, got a call from actually Frank Bell and uh, he said, hey, I, I heard that, you know, you you're thinking about, you know, changing jobs. I got to I got to have you. I don't know what I'm going to do with you, but I got to have you. you. You know, you're a pro guy uh, for this long. And uh, I came back up, had another second interview with the same guys and a, a different result because I've been with them ever since. So actually yeah. last, last week is 22 years. That I've been uh, congratulations, old. man. And so where are you at now? Are you still at? Are you, you well, I'm in Florence, Kentucky right now. Yep. Uh, that's what I, that's what I thought. Cause we talked Oregon, California, Kentucky. Yep. <clears throat> that's too far inland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There isn't an ocean nearby. We have the Ohio <laughs> river, but it's uh, you aren't going to catch me in there. Yeah. So, so what's the biggest change you have seen over the years in detailing? Oh, wow. There isn't just one. I mean, the biggest change I would say is probably the equipment is probably the biggest, you know, change. Yep. Uh, of course, the chemicals, the juice uh, has changed with the equipment. But, uh, you know, with the DA, you know, polishers uh, has really changed the game. Uh, for a lot of detailers, a lot of, you know, long term professionals and to the enthusiasts, uh, DIY uh, guys and girls, yeah. the uh, it's it's been a, a big you know change in the last, I would say, 12, 15 years. Uh, the industry has changed drastically. So a question for you, since you've been in both both arenas for a while, um, conventional body shop versus a detail shop. Um, and I spend some time in both. Uh, and so I'm kind of asking you a loaded question, but <clears throat> why is it do you think that body shops have held on to rotaries for so long and and still use the big rotary versus uh, uh, the newer polishers? Well, you know, Rod, you, you know, you bring up a good point that a lot of body shop guys are old school, you know, guys. Uh, but that is changing. I've yep. sold a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of DA machines into body shops here in the last five years. And that's changing, but it's been, you know, like that old school network. This is what we, you know, we use the rotary, a double-sided pad, uh, compound, and, you know, throw as much compound on a finish and it slings everywhere and then leave it to the detail guy to make it all look, you know, shiny and beautiful. Yep. Uh, but yeah, that is, uh, uh, it's just a, you know, I guess a mentality of the, uh, the body shop arena has changed drastically too. Mm -hmm. uh, over the yeah. years with, you know, the same thing, equipment, technology, paint, uh, government laws, you know, with, you know, low VOCs, uh, yeah. safety, you know, you can't just do things like you used to do, you know, 30, 40 years ago in a body shop. Yeah, it's just unheard of now. Right. Uh, and one of the big changes I've seen is that body shops are now open to paintless dent repair. Yeah. You know, where a few years ago, they didn't even want to talk to those, oh, those guys are great 
they're, yeah. you know, they'll never get everything out. And it was really a, a, a headbutting type of thing because it, literally at that point, the mentality was it took money out of their pockets. Yeah. Whereas now a body shop that has a paintless dent repair guy, they can just provide another service. Yep. Well, and, and with the body shop, mm. uh, you know, business, there's a lot of times where, you know, if you have a, uh, a dent or, or a, you know, even, you know, a pretty serious scratch and a fender, it's cheaper to, uh, to buy a whole new fender. And yeah. uh, instead of, you know, pounding out, you know, the dent that they used to and take it out, take it off, pound it, paint it, sand it, all that, polish it. It's just a lot easier and quicker uh, time wise just to replace that part. And that's yeah. what I see over the years has been a huge thing. That's why, you know, the PDR guys are very, very popular. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so when in your, in your mix with pro, what do you say the um, kind of the distribution is? Are you, are you more attuned to the professional detailing shop, the body shop or the DIY? Yes. <laughs> <All the other. laughs> yes. We, we sell, we will sell to anybody, but our, our main faucet, yeah. Uh, you know, for the last, we're an 84 year old company, uh, all family, you know, owned and, and ran company and still to this day, uh, you know, our main faucet is to our distributor network, which yeah. is our backbone. Uh, then, you know, I would say in the last five, six years, we've really tried to open up and explore the DIY, uh, the weekend enthusiast. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's people out there that are, a lot smarter, you know, kind of like how I was when I first saw somebody detail my car. It's like, hey, I can do that. There's a lot more guys that are, you know, wanting to uh, detail their own, you know, BMW, Mercedes, you know, whatever, you know, car, the classic car that they have. Uh, they don't want to hand it over to somebody. They want to uh, do it themselves. Right. Um, until there's a mistake and then they can't fix it. Then they mm -hmm. go to the professional. So. Is that what you're supposed to do when you make mistakes? <laughs> Crap, that's where I've been going wrong. <laughs> you, you just keep going, going after the same spot, man, so, over and over. I keep polishing this spot, this dark spot. Just keep getting bigger get and bigger. bigger, I, don't bigger. Know I actually saw that, and I really feel bad for the guy because he, he has a detailing shop that posted on a forum, and he was polishing, and it was on a – I can't remember what color the car was, but he went through. You could tell. It was obvious. He had a little spot. You could see that he'd gone through to the primer. And the next picture, it was bigger. And he goes, I just, I keep polishing this. And the spot just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And finally, people are like, stop, stop, stop. stop. <laughs> you are gone through the paint. You need, he's like, yeah, but it's shiny. And everybody's like, oh, man. Get a hold yeah, of you know, that, that's uh, interesting because that's actually <laughs> one of the things I teach in, in my training. Uh, you know, we get, you know, panels from junkyards or, you know, body shops that are uh, been, you know, ripped off of cars. And you know, put them on stands and everything. And I actually want my students to actually burn through a paint job. That's it. Yeah. And it's funny because I told the guy that, and we were in Vegas, and there was this young kid, and he bought a polisher. And he goes, he goes, I got to be honest with you, I'm afraid, I'm afraid to use it. And I said, go to a junkyard, buy a panel, put on the most aggressive and the least aggressive pads, get a compound, and then literally count how many passes at what pressure it takes you to burn through. Yep. I did it in my own shop to prove a point to my son-in-law. I bought one of those cheap denim pads that people claim are, oh, they save all. It'll burn through your, your uh, orange peel, which, yeah, it'll go right through the orange peel. Right. Um, but I wanted to show him how fast you could go through paint. And I took my uh, <clears throat> just a Flex 3401, a denim pad, and a pretty aggressive compound. And I hit, a uh, on purpose, a high spot. So I went to a high spot on, the, on this panel, and we started counting. And it was like four passes and the primer showed up. Yep. And I'm like, yeah, it'll go right through the clear, it'll go right through the orange peel and the clear coat and the base coat and the primer. Yep. It will burn through that. So he was he was totally amazed. I said, now get get the foam pad, same compound, same panel, same high spot, go down a little bit. Now do it with a foam pad. Look at how much more you've got to work with there. So um, you know, kind of trying to show him that don't be afraid of it, but start with the least aggressive, do a test panel, see how it looks, and then go back into it with something else if that doesn't work. Well, absolutely. The, the, <laughs> you know, the whole, you know, moral to that is you don't know how far you go until you've actually gone there. Yep. You know, it's kind of like walking to that edge of that cliff. You don't know until you've actually gotten to that, you know, that edge. And, uh, uh, that's why I always pick on, you know, people in my training, you know, classes in a fun way, 
is I always, you know, you always have the guys that know it all. And then you, then I go, well, how many years experience and so forth. And I kind of, you know, key on, you know, the guys that have a lot of experience. And then I'll say who has out of this class never gone through a paint, you know, finish. And I'll get a couple of hands. Now I got the guys I want to pick on and in a good way, in the sense of, okay, today you're going to go through a paint finish mm -hmm. because you haven't gone through and stretched your ability and know exactly what you can and cannot do until you've actually gone past that point. And yeah. hopefully we learn from our mistakes and you know, just from doing it, when to back off and say, I'm sorry, I can't go any farther. And that's, you know, going back to, you know, a detail uh, owner standpoint uh, and giving an estimate to a, a customer that's wanting, you know, it to look like brand new. Well, uh, sometimes can't do it. Sometimes, right. you know, we, don't have enough paint. we do yeah. what we can do. You know, we have to <laughs> yeah. leave some clear on there for the, for the next job. Uh, but you can't take every paint finish down to a sheet of glass and think that, you know, it's good. There's some cases that you can. Chances are that's aftermarket, you know, paint. It's not factory OEM paint. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's why, I mean, I think like you're talking earlier, innovations in the, in the industry, uh, paint thickness gauges, even yeah. an inexpensive one. 20 years ago to have a paint thickness gauge whoa you were you were top of the line you know most yeah, of the that time, was the paint gauge back in the day was my fingernail that's right that's right you just crossed <laughs> your fingers and hoped you didn't go through and so um <clears throat> i think that that's i don't want to say i mean i'm not it's not that detailers have it easier today they have a different set of challenges they have to deal with yeah some of those different challenges they have to deal with are the innovations i mean the speed at which you can achieve a finish today versus 20 years ago uh, is phenomenal. You know, like you said, when you got done polishing a car with a 12 inch rotary and some heavy compound, you're, you're re basically almost rewashing the car because there's compound everywhere. And, you know, heaven forbid you're doing a convertible because you got to tape the whole top off or, you know, right. So there's, there's all kinds of innovations that have happened, different sets of challenges. Um, now you've got so many different pad combinations and, you know, depending on the paint, if you're working on a GM car, you either have the most brittle paint in the entire world or some of the new models are horrible. And, you know, um, even this this week, I saw an article from uh, Elon Musk where he admitted that the, the QA on a Tesla paint is just crap. You mm -hmm. might get one that's beautiful. You might get one that's just absolutely horrible. So um, everybody has to deal with those challenges. And, you know, still, even with all that innovation and everything, I still see <clears throat> the forums Somebody will ask a really generic question like, hey, how much do you charge for a single stage correction? And I'm like, there's nobody that can answer that. What, what right. car are we talking about? What environment are you in? What's the heat? What's the moisture? What compound are you using? What pad are you using? How old is the paint? I mean, the questions are unlimited. So I think the basic thing is for years, detailers have said, I got to see the car. And... I think their biggest challenge is to explain that to a client that I can't give you a definitive answer until I physically get my eyes on it. Yeah, I absolutely refuse to give anybody a quote over the phone. And I learned that from the body you know, shop collision guy uh, that I uh, became really good friends with is, you know, you're going to call up a body shop and say, how much is it to fix my car? No, that's ne that's never going to happen. Same right. way with reconditioning, you know, your car inside now. You know, the, the professional needs to take a look at it and, and see, you know, exactly. I can give you a ballpark, but you aren't going to like the ballpark because it's going to be, you know, high and then it's going to be higher. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, and yeah. You're going to thin out your customers that way. You know, the ones that are, are wanting, uh, you know, they have a set price point that they can afford. That's where it goes to those, you know, those other detail shops that are willing to do that, you know, type of work. And then you set yourself apart that, uh, you know, the higher end professional uh, detailers, uh, you know, they they really should be, you know, uh, charging decent money. They yeah. it's hard work. And I'm glad to see that uh, there's a lot more detail shops and detailers out there that are finally understanding that, uh, you know, detailing a car mm -hmm. for ninety five dollars. I hope those days are, are gone, but there there's still guys out there doing them. I, I, I saw one. With it because you get what you pay for. And that's always been one of my mottos is, you know, you get what you pay for. Right. There's a, there was a, I saw one today 
um, this morning I was sitting drinking coffee, looking through Facebook and there's a guy advertising $60 full detail. I'm like that you are, you're not making it. <clears throat> yeah. I'm sure you've got cars lined up, but <clears throat> you're not making it. You're, you're working for, you know, single digits an hour, you know, yeah. and killing yourself to do it. You'd be better off taking a third of the cars and bumping your price to a buck 25 and, and, slowing down and making yourself an actual living. So <clears throat> too many people, I think, fall into the trap and detailing of creating themselves a really hard job mm -hmm. that has great benefits. I, I you know, I, um, <clears throat> I'm i lucky enough that I have, you know, we own a software company. I don't detail for a living, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm IDA certified. And I've been working on cars since the 80s. Car guy. But I have, a sh I have two shops. I have one at my home and then one on a different property. But my shop at home is, you know, it's right out my back door. So I have the opportunity to go out and work in my shop and I love it. The benefits of having your own shop and working at home are, you can't put a price on that. There's right. so many people that we talk to, that we interview that are like, I work at home. If my daughter needs help with her homework, I can stop and help her. That is invaluable. I get yeah. it. But at the same time, <clears throat> you have to do more than cover your overhead. And a $60 detail is not going to cover your overhead. No. You know, your machine has a life. It has an end of life. Your your pads and polishes have, they're, they're a consumable. You're going to purchase more of these all the time. And if you're doing it right, you've got three or four sets of them because they get hot and you need to clean them and all that stuff. So the guys that are doing it for, for less than it's worth, you're, you're just, you're running on a treadmill and you're never going to make it. Well, you know, right, you bring up a good point because those are the guys that I like to go and talk to. Yeah. Um, to try to bring them up uh, to that professional, uh, you know, level. And, uh, you know, that's why, uh, you know, Jody and I were talking about this earlier is, you know, the IDA. I'm so, you know, an advocate of IDA. You know, I'm the uh, vice president of uh, operator or not operators, but suppliers. Yeah. And uh, we've been, you know, with the uh, IDA for, you know, mm -hmm. back in 08, you know, when it started. Uh, as a founding member. And uh, I I wish I had, you know, that network back in my day starting out. I would have, you know, spent whatever money uh, to be part of, you know, that association. And uh, uh, I have a really soft spot for those, you know, those detailers that they, they're giving their work away. They, you know, I've been in their shoes, you know, I've been, you know, yep. down there detailing cars for, you know, for nickels and dimes, literally, you know, I mean, the tip was, you know, under the seat. And uh, <laughs> so I want to bring those guys up and uh, there's no reason why those guys should not be charging, you know, 175, $250 mm -hmm. in a, a complete detail. They're going to feel better at the end of the day that they actually have money in their checking account uh, than, you know, going from detail to detail, uh, day to day, you know, type of uh, income. Right. And, uh, uh, and you know, go ahead. The, uh, the one of the things I wanted to say is when we, we're, again, here we go, Founders Club right there. We're part of the idea and we really agree with it. And I, I want to take just a second to, the, I, I watch people bash the IDA and I look at those people that are doing that, and I just, you're idiots. I don't care who you are, you're an idiot. Every every single job in the United States that is a professional job has some kind of an organization. Mm -hmm. And if you are bashing the one organization that has your best interests in mind, take a look in the mirror. Right. They provide endless opportunities for training, um, for, for you to, for certification, which... People look at it and go, oh, so what? It's a piece of paper. Oh, yes. Okay. So there's a lot of piece of papers in life. And this is another one that's important. I have physically been in somebody's shop in Central Oregon with their IDA certifications on the wall and seen a, car, a customer come in and go over and look at that certification. And it just solidified in that customer's mind the professionalism and the fact that this detailer has gone the extra mile to become a certified detailer. The cost is minimal. Yep. And the benefits are unbelievable. You can post that all the time. You're a professional detailer. And if it's you versus somebody that's not a professional, nine times out of 10, the person that has a professional certification is going to get the job. And well, so they're, they're going to get the job. They're going to do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like walking into, you know, the, the hospital, the doctor's office. 
you know, if you don't see those, those, uh, you know, MD initials on that guy's, you know, or girls, you know, coat, right, right. Uh, and, and, you know, the doctor comes in with a polo shirt, uh, you're going to be second guessing if I'm in the right spot. Right. And, and this, imagine great scenario. Imagine walking in there and go to have the doctor go, you know, those professional medical associations, they're just crap. I'm self-taught. Yeah. I, I went to YouTube. I'm a YouTube certified surgeon. Let's go right. bring it. You're right. not going to, you're like, whoa, I'm back. Not going to think about all the industries that you would back away from if that person didn't have some kind of a certification. Those ongoing educational <laughs> credits. Yeah. yeah. Who needs those, you yeah. know? <laughs> so, so it, it's funny because people don't equate that back. And I think that it's out of, I think part of it's out of fear. They're they're afraid to take that step. They're afraid to see what they might find. Look, yes, the certification, the the some of the tests. If you know what you're doing, they're not hard. No. Okay. I I've done it, right? And I'm not a detailer. I I play one on TV, but I but anybody can pass these if you know what you're doing. If you've had a little bit of training, and I think that's what's important is the education and the ongoing training. They are. Again, invaluable. Take the time to learn your trade and continuously improve. Well, um, even even if you just learn one tip that makes you more efficient, yeah, right. You may know how to polish a car, but if if you're in with one of those RTs and he gives you one tip that saves you <clears throat> ten minutes, fifteen minutes, that is money in your pocket, and it's also better service for your customer. Well, and the other thing is that. Those training can you like you said you will learn one or two things. You're not going to you you might know some of it. Take take the take the boat training versus the automotive training. Ah, it's just another no. It's totally different. Gel totally coat different. is a new animal. If you've never polished gel coat, you will not just just a perfect example. You polish it out, come back the next day, it's a different boat. You know, that this, you know, reminds me of a conversation I had with a, a gentleman, uh, you know, Prentice St. Clair that you guys, uh, you know, know. Yep. Love Prentice. Uh, when I worked for that distributor in San Diego, well, we had four uh, training uh, events uh, every year. Mm -hmm. And he was at every single one. And I could tell, I could pick up, you know, he knew what he was doing. And I went up to him and I said, Prentice, you know, this has got to be your eight, you know, attendance or, you know, I don't know how many you're at every one. Why are you here? And he just looked at me and he goes, yeah, but, you know, I pick up something from you every single time I listen to you. I pick up, you know, something from somebody else that's here mm -hmm. that's as a student. It's all about learning and it's always about networking and you never stop learning. And right. And that's always stuck with me with, with Prentice. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is Prentice St. Clair, I helped train back in the day. Uh, and he's actually the one who certified me, uh, you know, as a CDSV, uh, yeah. you know, years later. So we get kind of a, uh, uh, he calls me, uh, I'm his first, you know, uh, uh, you know, teacher in, in detailing, but uh uh, you know, I'm, I'm humble. I, he's had other great, you know, teachers, but you know, that whole thing about showing up at a event or some type of training it really stuck with me. And, and I think you picked up on it, you know, Rod, is I think a lot of detailers have that fear, that envy yeah. uh, that they need to, you know, they need to swallow that mm -hmm. pride pill and be exposed and it's exposing yourself, but when you expose yourself, you get to absorb as you're ex exposing yourself. So yeah. that's where the IDA comes in is you have some of the top, you know, professional detailers part of IDA, mm -hmm. and they're willing to give you that knowledge free. Yeah, they're willing to you know talk mm -hmm. to you and you know guide you and, and network with you and help you out where. Yeah, you know, nowadays detailers do have it a little bit easy in that aspect. Where back in my day, you know, back when Rennie Doyle started, you know, he was, you know, he didn't have, you know, figuring all the, it out. Yeah, <laughs> figuring it out on your own. <laughs> and figuring I think it that, out. That's, a, you know, you mentioned Prentice, and and Prentice is absolutely an awesome person. If you've never met Prentice, you guys all need to take one of the best. In the but it, it's he's very, very humble. Mm -hmm. We've had the opportunity to not just. 
you know, work with parent apprentice and see them at RTs and training and stuff. We've actually had the opportunity to work side by side with him on projects like Air Force One. And he is, like, like you said, he's super, super humble, but he had probably has more knowledge than 90% of the people out there. But he's always willing to learn from somebody else. And I think that is, if I had to say, if you, somebody asked one time, was a, we were watching some uh, either a podcast or a forum, and somebody said, if you could change one thing about the industry, what would it be? I would say, humble people down a little bit. I mean, at the end of the day, you you're a you're a, a craftsman, you're an artist, you do what you do, but we're not saving people's lives. Okay, we're not right. brain surgeons, and some of these people are. I'm talking to their heads are so big about what they do, and I'm like. That it's beyond peacocking. I'm like, dude, you're not Elon Musk. You just, <laughs> I don't want to downplay what you do for a living, but have a little bit of humility. This yeah, is you know, Prentice is a class, you know, a class guy, you know, 100%. Uh, he is, uh, he's very humble. And uh, uh, if we had more, you know, people like Prentice, uh, this, this uh, world would be a better place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And, you know, it's, yeah. There are so many um, lessons to be learned by watching somebody that is always trying to excel, right? Mm -hmm. He has the ability to go, you know what? I don't know everything. Yes, I'm seasoned. Yes, I have tons of experience, but I there are little things that I still don't that I don't know. And I'm trying to elevate my game not only as a business owner but also as a professional, I look at detailpreneurs and Jonah Gomez. He really focuses not only on business, but also personal development. And so when you can combine those things, yep. it really will elevate your game and kind of in wrap up, you know, we've been going and I can tell we, we probably could go a full hour, but <laughs> what are one or two things that you think are absolutely critical for a detailed business owner to implement in their business to help them be successful? Well, you know, this goes back to, you know, that collision, you know, uh, guy, um, the, uh, you know, we sat down one night and talked to, you know, about the expenses, you know, wh why are you charging this and, and so forth? Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't really have an answer. I was like, well, that's what the, you know, the guy down the street or, you know, on the other side of town, that's what he charges. Uh, you know, I think really to know what, you know, what your overhead is and having some type of, uh, you know, software package bill to, you know, tell you exactly where you are. Is yeah. this, you can be the best detailer, have the best craft. Uh, but if you don't know the business end of any business, uh, especially detailing, you won't succeed. You, you'll be around five, six, maybe, you know, uh, eight years, but you won't succeed. You right. won't get your potential without that. And yeah. I think a lot of detailers, majority of them are more detailing, more craft related than they are business guys. And I see a lot more nowadays, the business guys that are learning detail and it's a great marriage. I mean, it's definitely yeah. it needs to be there. Um, you know, they need to know uh, the business end of it to be, are you in it just for five years or are you in this for, you know, 15, 20, 30 years, you know, and then end up selling your business. Right, right. And I think that that I, perfect, perfect thing is that people that, you know, if you don't want it to be a job, you have to learn how to make it a business. Right. And the people that are humble and want to make it a business. And, you know, as you started mentioning Apprentice, it started going through my head. Some of the people that, that I've had the opportunity to train with and 90 percent of my favorite people that I've trained with are very, very humble. I mean, Jason yeah. Kilmer, um, you know, one of the most soft spoken guys in the world is but so knowledgeable about sanding and and refinishing your car. He's almost like a guru. He just, the whole mood of everything comes like down. Sensei, and man. He just gets in there and there's just these little strokes and you're like, okay, we're about to do some Zen body work right here. <laughs> That's it, man. And that, you know, Prentice and some of the Diana Balboni, I mean, my God, some of these people are just, they are absolute, uh, they're just a humility that they have. And I think that that is something that uh, I think most businesses are missing, but this one in general. And if you can, if you can latch onto those people and learn from them, and I'm again back to the full circle about the IDA and some of the people like you. We've heard so many good things about you from, from friends of yours, Big D and stuff. Is that, you know, just the ability that if if I called you on the phone, you're going to answer it. Yeah. You know, and there's no question. I could call you up and say, Hey, Bob, I'm, I'm really struggling on this. What can you do? And you you give me a good answer. There's a ton of people out there 
the network that we have within the detailing industry is super strong. That's a big positive that I see in the industry is unlike any other industry, you can call people up and ask them a question and they'll answer it. Yeah, definitely. You know, that, that's what's uh, uh, not really, you know, exposed that much, uh, uh, you know, to a lot of uh, detailers that are wanting to, you know, hey, I don't need to be in the IDA uh, or, you know, what can the IDA do for me? It, it's right. that that scenario right there is, you know, this is the networking alone, uh, being able to connect, email, you know, chat. Uh, you know, I, I get it, you know, um, you know, every week, every day. Uh, questions. I know, you know, Big D does too. Um, you know, and that's where, you know, I, I'll do a little plug here for the SDC coming up in June. Uh, you know, that trade show you know, hopefully will we'll, uh, go on and, uh, you know, with uh, whatever precautions, but uh, yeah. that trade show is going to be a little bit different than any other trade show. And I admire his, his vision of making it a, a hands-on type of trade show. So, you know, if, if uh, detailers want to show up and learn and talk with the actual manufacturer's reps and, you know, touch the equipment, uh, play with the pads, the juice, the, you know, the, uh, the compounds, the polishes, the coatings, uh, anything, you know, uh, involved with detailing, you're going to be able to, you know, have some good quality time, uh, you know, with those, you know, reps. And, yep. and that's what it's about. I mean, we're, we're, this whole IDA family it's, it's literally about helping each other. And, uh, you know, going back to Prentice, he still asks questions. The guy does. He knows way more than, than what he perceives that he does, but he still asks questions. I really admire, you know, people that I know that are very professional and know their stuff about detailing. But there's those, guys, those people that are still asking questions how you how do you do this or what do you use? What's your mm -hmm. technique? I really admire people like that because yeah, they yeah. want to learn. You know, yeah, yeah. my motto is never stop learning. Never so, stop learning. And so, man, so how do people get hold of you? Well, you know, a personal email is proax guy at hotmail. Uh phone number is uh that I've had for years is 859-462-8010, uh proax.com. Uh, I know we are on Instagram. I think it's Pro Car Beauty Products on Instagram, and then our Facebook page. Um, very accessible uh, nowadays. I it's sometimes a little too much. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, isn't that the truth? So. Like I always say to people, if you can't find them, you're not looking. So right, right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. It has been a wonderful conversation. Very insightful. For those of you tuning in, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube, Instagram channels. We love to talk to you. So reach out if you have somebody that you would like us to interview or if you'd like to be on the show. We're always looking to share your story. Yep. And remember, we do have the 2021 giveaway giveaway relief package with uh, the <coughs> Business John Ham Road package. Yeah, so uh, get involved in that. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Give us a shout. Um, hashtag Reflection Artist. Hashtag Buff and Shine Manufacturing. And hashtag RoadFS. And again, if you can't find us, then you're really not looking. And you'll be in the drawing for a big, huge box of giveaway stuff. Free software. Um, uh, look in the upcoming months because we are going to be doing some highlighting of the SDC. Jody and I are also big, major sponsors of the SDC. You actually can have hands-on work with the software people all the time come in and go can it do this can it do this well here you go you just take off and go plus we will be having a live separate booth just for road fs detail memoirs we'll be operating live the entire show so it's going to be fun get involved yeah so well thank you so, much, so much bob fun. we appreciate you and uh we will check you guys same time same bad channel just next week see ya thank you, guys thank yep, you very absolutely. much absolutely thank, thank you time. brother all right, take care.